section nineteen of margaret of angouleme queen of navarre by agnes mary francis robinson this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter fourteen the heptameron two fifteen forty four part one i have not yet noticed the claim of charles nodier to give the heptameron to bonaventure des perriers for indeed i believe this claim has very few supporters and that it would be impossible to prove its justice on the other side on the side of margaret is ranked all past tradition all modern authority brantome whose grandmother held the inkhorn for the queen claude gruget who copied the unfinished text and gave the heptameron written for the court to the world at large and in modern days michelet Genon, the bibliophile jacob m roux de lincy with all margaret's historians and editors affirm the book to be written by her hand miss freer to whom margaret's heptameron appears the first flex fall on her wonder of white would gladly accept the theory of nodier but with the best will in the world she cannot be convinced indeed he has a hard case to prove des perriers left so very little authentic work behind him that the argument of similarity of style goes for almost nothing we know less of des perriers style than of margaret's and the style of the heptameron is a woman's style we have absolutely no direct evidence that des perriers had any share in the book he was a valet de chambre to the queen of navarre but so were most of the men of letters of his age the untrustworthy testimony of the abbe gouget who relates that bonaventure des perriers helped the queen in her novels and her poems is all that nodier can find to support him he is too shrewd to believe that des perriers an avowed atheist and of a fanatic scepticism had a hand in the mystical rodomontade of les marguerites de la marguerite but he is in truth scarcely better justified in attributing the heptameron to an unbeliever the bursts of lutheran eloquence the tendency to round off all discussion with a text the tone of somewhat unctuous mystical piety all these are eminently characteristic of margaret they could scarcely be considered likely attributes of le joyeux bonaventure dismissing then this theory of nodier's let us consider the merits of the heptameron itself to-day it is scarcely a work that one would choose to read from end to end for pleasure this is not only on account of its grossness for it is infinitely less indecent than many works of the sixteenth century which are certainly well read at present putting aside such writers as brantome rabelais or bandello it is less coarse than much of shakespeare but on reading this book one becomes poignantly aware that it falls short not only of our standard of decency but of our idea of pathos of humour of interest there is none of the genius which sees the human being and not the apparel none of the passion the poetry the wide and human wisdom which have saved greater writers from the pleasures of an altered age its virtues as well as its faults are merely of the time and not particular and it is well that the heptameron should be merely the delight of students and the treasure of antiquarians there is to begin with but one truly pathetic situation in the book it is in the second novel where the queen's muleteer returning from amboise sees stretched across the doorway of his house a bier with the white-covered corpse of the wife whom he left well and safe two days ago and who has been foully outraged since then and murdered singularly little is made of this poignant moment what interested margaret and her courtly readers is no longer interesting to the taste of to-day at once much simpler and far more subtle yet not to be unfair to a very famous book i have translated two extremely characteristic stories and as the conversations in between the novels are by far the liveliest and most vigorous part of the heptameron i have chosen two that follow each other novel sixty four 
a gentleman disdained in marriage enters a monastery wherefore his lady does as much for him in the town of valencia there lived a gentleman who during five or six years had loved a lady so perfectly that neither of them was hurt in honour nor in conscience thereby for his intention was to make her his wife and reasonably enough as he was handsome rich and of a noble house and he had not placed himself at her service without first making known his desire to arrange a marriage with the goodwill of her friends and these being assembled for that purpose found the match in every way fitting if the girl herself should be of their mind but she either hoping to find a better or wishing to hide the love she had for the youth discovered an obstacle so the company was broken up not without regretting that she could not give the affair a better ending seeing that on both sides the match was good but above all assembled the poor gentleman was wroth who could have borne his misfortune patiently had he believed the fault to lie with her friends and not with her but knowing the truth to believe which was more bitter than death he returned home without a word to his lady-love or any other there and having put some order in his affairs he went away into a desolate place where he sought with pains and trouble to forget his affection and to turn it wholly to the love of our saviour jesus christ to which affection he was without comparison the more obliged and during this time he never heard either from his lady or from her friends therefore he resolved having failed in the happiest life he could have hoped to take and choose the most austere and disagreeable and full of this sad thought which one might call despair he went to become a monk at a franciscan monastery close to which lived several of his friends these having heard of his despair made every effort to hinder his resolve but so firmly was it rooted in his heart they could not turn him from it nevertheless knowing his ailment they thought to find the medicine and went to her who was the cause of his sudden devotion finding her much bewildered and astonished at their news for she had meant her refusal which was but for a time to test the true love of her lover and not to lose it for ever and seeing the evident danger of this she sent him an epistle which rudely rendered runs as follows because unless it well be proven love for strong and loyal no one can approve i wished to wait till proven to my mind was that i longed so ardently to find a husband full of perfect love it was that i desired a love that would not pass and so i begged my parents not to haste still to delay let one year two years waste before i played the game that must endure till death which many a one repents for sure i never said i would not have your love so great a loss i was not dreaming of for certes none but you i loved at all none other would i lord and husband call ah me my love what bitterness to say that thou without a word art gone away a narrow cell a convent life austere these are your choice o misery to hear now must i change my office pleading so as once in guileless words you used to do requiring that which was of me required acquiring him by whom i was acquired nay now my love life of the life of me i do not care to live bereft of thee ah turn again thy distant eyes to mine turn on thy steps if so they will incline leave thou the cowl of grey the life austere all of my love and all my heart are here by thee so many times so much desired time hath not changed my heart it hath not tired for thee for thee alone i keep my heart and that must break if thou must keep apart come then again return believe thy dear consider in thy mind how many a year we might be happy joined in holy marriage and me believe and not thy cruel courage be sure i never meant to say or do a word to wound a deed to make thee rue i meant to make you happy dear enough when i had full assurance of your love and now indeed my heart is fixed and sure thy firmness faith and patience to endure and over all thy love i know and see 
and they have gained me wholly dear to thee. Come now, and take the thing that is thine own, for thine am I, and thou be mine alone. This letter, carried by one of his friends, along with all possible remonstrances, was received by the gentleman Franciscan with a very mournful countenance, and with so many sighs and tears, it seemed as though he meant to burn or drown the poor little letter, but he made no answer to it, telling the messenger that the mortification of his extreme passion had cost him so dear that now he neither cared to live nor feared to die. Wherefore he begged her who had been the occasion of his grief, since she had not chosen to content the passion of his great desires, not to torment him now that he was quit of them, but to content herself with the evil done, for which he could find no other remedy than the choice of this rude life, whose continual penance put his sorrow out of mind, and by fasts and discipline enfeebled his body, so that the remembrance of death had become his sovereign consolation. And above all, he prayed her never to let him hear any news of her, for even the memory of her name had become an insupportable purgatory to him. The gentleman returned with this mournful answer, delivering it to her who could not hear it without incredible regret. But love, which lets not the spirit fail until it is in extremity, put it into her fancy that if she could only see him, the sight of her and the voice of her would have more force than writing. Wherefore, accompanied by her father and the nearest of her kin, she set out for the monastery where he dwelt, having left nothing in her tire-closet that could heighten the aspect of her beauty, and sure she felt that if he could but see her once and hear her speak, it would be impossible that the flame so long continued in their hearts should not light up again and stronger than before. Therefore, entering the monastery about the end of Vespers, she had him called to a chapel in the cloisters. He who knew not who was asking for him went to fight the hardest battle he had ever fought. And when she saw him all pale and undone, so that she scarcely knew him again, yet filled none the less with a grace no less amiable than before, then love constrained her to stretch out her arms, thinking to embrace him. But the pity of seeing him in such a state sent such a sudden weakness to her heart that she fell down fainting. Then the poor monk, who was not destitute of brotherly charity, lifted her up and sate her on a seat there was in the chapel. And he himself, who no less needed succor, made as if he felt no passion, strengthening his heart in the love of his God against the opportunity that tempted him, so that he seemed, from his countenance, to ignore that which he saw. She, coming to life again, turned on him her eyes, that were so beautiful and piteous they would have softened stone, and began to tell him all the thoughts she had to draw him from that place, to which he answered in the most virtuous manner that he could. But in the end the poor monk, feeling his heart melt before the abundant tears of his darling, as one who sees love, the cruel archer, whose wound he has long suffered from, make ready his golden arrow to strike him in a fresh and mortal part, even so he fled away from love and his beloved, as though the only force left to him lay in flight. And being shut in his chamber, not wishing to let her go without some resolution taken, he wrote to her a few words in Spanish, which I have found so excellent in substance that I have not chosen to diminish their grace by any rendering of mine, and these words he sent to her by a little novice who found her still in the chapel, in such despair, that had it been lawful for her to take the veil in that monastery she would have stayed. But on seeing the writing, which said, Volvete domeniste anima mi, que en las tristas vidas es la mía, she, knowing by these words that all her hopes had failed, determined to believe the counsel of him and of her friends, and return to her own home to lead there as melancholy a life as her lover spent austerely in his monastery. Thus you see, ladies, the vengeance this gentleman took on his hard-hearted love, who, thinking to make an experiment of his truth, drove him to despair in such a manner, that when she would she could not have him again. I am sorry, said Nomerfide, 
that he did not doff his cowl to go and marry her, for then methinks there would have been a perfect marriage. Of a truth, said Simonto, I think he was very wise, for who has well considered the marriage state will not esteem it less vexatious than an austere devotion, and he so greatly weakened by fasts and abstinences feared to take upon him such a lifelong burden. It seems to me, said Hircan, she did very wrong to so weak a man in trying to tempt him with marriage. That is too much for the strongest man in the world. But had she only spoken of love and friendship with no other bondage than that of will, there is no cord would not have been broken nor not untied. Yet seeing that for escape from purgatory she offered him hell, I think he had good reason to refuse. In faith, said Emersuite, there are many who, intending to do better than others, do worse, or at least the very reverse of what they would. Truly, said Gebron, you put me in mind, a propos of nothing, of one who did the opposite of her intention, and therefrom came a great tumult in the church of St. John of Lyon. Prithee then, said Parlamente, take my place and tell us the tale. My tale, said Gebron, will neither be so long nor so piteous as that of Parlamente. Novel 65 The simplicity of an old woman, who, offering a lighted taper to St. John of Lyon, stuck it to the forehead of a soldier who lay asleep there on a sepulchre. In the church of St. John of Lyon there was a very dark chapel, and within it a stone sepulchre, carved in high relief with images as large as life, and all round the sepulchre the likeness of many men-at-arms lay as if asleep. A soldier, strolling one day about the church, during the great heat of summer, felt drowsy with the warmth, and looking at the dark, cool chapel, he thought he would go to the sepulchre and sleep there among the other men-at-arms, and so he lay down beside the images. Now it happened that a good old woman, very pious, came to the chapel as he lay fast asleep, and after she had said her prayers, holding a candle in her hand, she meant to fix it against the sepulchre, and finding nearest her the sleeping man, she would have stuck it to his forehead, believing him a stone image, but against this stone the wax would not hold. The good woman, thinking it was because the image was so chill, held the flame against his brow, to make it warm enough for her candle to stick there, but the image, which was not insensible, began to call out, and which the woman, nearly out of her mind with fear, took to crying, A miracle! A miracle! And so loud that all who were in the church began to run, some to ring the bells and some to see the miracle, and the good woman led them to the image which had moved, which gave occasion for laughter to many present, but several priests could not content themselves so easily, for they had hoped in their hearts to turn this sepulchre to good account and make money out of it. Look you, therefore, ladies, to what saints you give your candles. It's a great thing to know, said Hircan, that whatever they set about, women always must do wrong. Is it doing wrong, said Nomerfid, to carry candles to a sepulchre? Yes, said Hircan, when they set fire to men's foreheads, for no good thing can call itself good when it is done badly. Fancy, the poor woman thought she was making God a fine present of her little candle. God does not regard, said Oisy, the value of a gift, but the heart that gives it. It may be this good woman had more love for God than those who give him their great torches, for as the scripture says, she hath cast in of her need even all her substance. Yet I will not believe, said Safredon, that God, who is sovereign wisdom, can take pleasure in the foolishness of women, for let simplicity please him as it will, I see in the scripture he makes no account of the ignorant, and if he commands us to be simple as the dove, he commands no less the wisdom of the serpent. As for me, said Oisy, I esteem her not ignorant who carries to God her candle or lighted taper, carrying it as one who recants her sin, kneeling on the ground, torch in hand, before her sovereign Saviour, to whom, confessing her damnation, she appeals in a sure hope for mercy and salvation. Would to God, said Dagousson, that everyone understood the matter as well as you. 
but I believe these poor simpletons have no such meaning in their deeds. Wazi answered him, Those who least know how to tell it are often those who feel the most the love of God and of his will, wherefore we should judge no one but ourself. Emer Sweet, in laughing, added, It is not so strange a thing to have frighted a sleeping clown, for women as low-born as she have made great princes afraid, and without setting fire to their foreheads. I am sure, said Dagoussin, that you know some story you will tell us, wherefore you will take my place, if you please. The story will not be long, said Emarsuit, but if I can tell it as it happened, you will have no need to weep about it. End of section 19《20 of Margaret of Angouleme, Queen of Navarre, by Agnes Mary Frances Robinson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 14, The Heptameron II, 1544, Part 2. The first of these stories gives a good idea of the romantic side of the Heptameron. All the pathetic tales are much the same. It is impossible today to care for Florinde and Amador, for all the various true lovers who see each other fall in raptures are parted and retire each to a separate monastery. This is Margaret's stock idea of the heart-rending, and the people of the Heptameron cherish this ideal of pathos, as perhaps the ideal is always cherished, in defiance of the conduct of actual life. Not one of them would allow a daughter to marry for love. You may say what you will, says Wazi. Nonetheless, we must recognize paternal authority, for if people married at pleasure, what unhappy marriages would there not be? Is it to be expected that a young man and girl from twelve to fifteen years of age can understand what is really their good? And if you consider those who have married for love come off far worse as a rule than those who are married by force, for young men not knowing what is fit for them take the first they find without consideration, then they discover their error and go from bad to worse, whereas a forced marriage is generally made by those who have more judgment and experience than those whom it chiefly concerns, so that when these discover all the benefits they did not understand, they savor and embrace these with the greater affection. Thus discourses Wazi in dialogue with her companions, thinking, no doubt, a little bitterly of the rebellious conduct of Mademoiselle d'Albray. And this is the real opinion of the whole society. But let any one of them begin on a pathetic tale, and we shall have the old puppets, the sentimental youth, the heartbroken young lady, and the whole company will melt into tears for a suffering which, safely off the stage of the ideal, would elicit only their anger or their contempt. But we of a later generation listen with cheeks unwet. This artificiality grates upon us. These broken hearts are all too much alike. When the story takes a humorous turn, new difficulties arise. Queen Margaret certainly shows more spirit and vigor in this direction. Her satire is often shrewd. She has a certain enjoyment of life, of pleasure, of adventure, and even of grossness, which is at all events better than the pointless pretense of her pathos. It, at least, is real, and it is very characteristic of her, of her nation, and of her time. It has a certain historical value, this free, loose, reckless gaiety of hers. And though there is intrinsically little humor in it, there is much humor in the reader's mind, who notes the odd conjunction of this Rabelaisian fancy with the mystical piety of Oisy. It gives his imagination a certain humorous shock to realize that these moods are perfectly compatible with each other. But the real value of the Heptameron lies in a certain direct actuality, in the description of life and manners in such a town as Alençon or Amboise at that period. 
we can frame a fair idea of the relative position of classes of the all-pervading wealth and comfort the great amount of time given to idleness and pleasure and also of the thousand sad incongruities which france presented then in this sense the heptameron is really interesting we rummage among its outdated gallantry and strangely fashioned piety and forgotten in the medley we find a handful of the life of the past we feel it in our hands as we had never hoped to feel it and for its sake we pardon a multitude of sins a great many details quite absurd and trivial which the queen merely introduced because they really happened surprise and delight us from the very first novel of all we seem plunged in a strange world of contrast a world of beautiful light-minded ladies who spend their time embroidering red silk counterpanes in reading la belle dame sans merci in devising interviews with their lovers or in visiting the magician of the town to watch the wasting of wax effigies of those whom they would slay galerie was this wizard's name it gives us a little shock to meet him in such modern and cultured society but we find stranger flaws in this sumptuous civilization torture is still used in the civic trials of alencon where the duke has absolute power of life and death like any duke in shakespeare's plays ten crowns is the proper wage for a hired assassin and we are delighted to know the exact amount that we should pay him sanctuary is still given in palaces and churches and the orthodox way to secure the ends of justice is by starving out the refugees all this seems out of date beside the general spread of wealth and comfort even among the lower bourgeoisie servants are to be found in every house engaged by the quarter not by the year as in england there is abundance of rich tapestries in the humblest households the beds even of the servants are finely curtained and the lit d'honneur is large enough to hold four or five persons it is still considered a mark of esteem to invite a distinguished guest to share the couch of the host and hostess yet in other respects there is no lack of privacy the wives of the small burghers of the clerks the shopkeepers the advocates have dressing-rooms and parlours their houses have large gardens and orchards there's plenty of room there's also plenty of money when the clerk's son goes to woo the draper's daughter he and his mother make a great purchase of thick silks choosing everything they like for as for money you know how little in need of that sort of drug these shopkeepers are the women dress in fine taffetas in silks even in velvet which once was only worn by women of good family there is no dearth of good cheer of comfort even of luxury among these people who may none the less be burned for heresy or witchcraft or racked to death if they offend the law the chief blot on this rich diffusion of wealth is the corruption of the clergy the confessor if all tales be true is a real danger in every household the convents and monasteries offered more serious perils to innocent youth than even the thoughtless world outside meanwhile society went smoothly on deriving perhaps some satisfaction from the shortcomings of its spiritual pastors it was a merry world my masters but corrupt at the heart all the same the corruption of course is especially in evidence in the book before us for it was margaret's object to expose the radical dangers of a celibate priesthood the worldliness of a church avowedly malcontent with merely spiritual power and the gross ignorances which the popularity of the begging friars had introduced even into the pulpit and the confessional margaret had it greatly at heart to reform the catholic church and of course the need of reform is emphasized in her novels but the sense of general well-being and good humor of life and vigor and wealth of a rising and influential bourgeoisie these signs of prosperity are quite intrinsic quite natural and unconsidered 
immoral lax irreligious as it is this world of the heptameron compares favourably enough with the world of the italian novelists full of wars plague cruelty and unnatural vices although infinitely less pure it has superior points to the world of cervantes novelas with its violent contrasts of squalid beggars and merchants from the indies fabulously rich with its gold fever in the air its epidemic of vagabondage its national blight of jealousy and slavery and persecution it is still the world of gargantua although at the solemn court of the dauphin a more decorous world is already taking shape the orthodox world of tartuffe this actuality is the true salt of the heptameron it is a document which instructs one in the life of france at that time in the characters also of the rulers of france here one meets the king as he was in life light-minded chivalric in battle picturesquely magnanimous to the traitor who would have murdered him a traitor himself to the advocate who would have served him free liver and free lover as he was free thinker almost worst crime of all one sees in the heptameron the dashing effective qualities which secured to francis the devotion of his subjects and the admiration of the world impetuous impulsive heroic at a pinch the very qualities which made him an unsteady ruler made him a prince to adore his reckless battles his sudden determinations one day for luther the next for the inquisition one day the friend of the pope the next of soliman his worship of beauty and pleasure his public magnificence his affable splendour even his misfortunes combined to give a most picturesque light and shade to his character one can understand his popularity in a time when patriotism merely meant devotion to the prince in a time when the country was content to be the property of the ruler for the francis of the heptameron has many popular qualities he is brave gallant magnanimous and cheerful but if the heptameron instructs one in the character of francis far more striking is the portrait which it gives of margaret herself in her later youth and middle age very different from the exquisite profile which michelet has etched for us though this is true enough no doubt of the margaret of meaux we must none the less accept this later likeness for the artist painted herself no delicate profile this a full face laughing with shrewd humorous lips and the great nose of francis grown coarser than in her girlish days a face that has experienced many aspects of life and fortune and has learned a tolerant clear-sightedness for their pretensions no mystic's face now with the faint undecided features yet with a certain wistful and religious spirit in the eyes and in the smile making her still hope to find in heaven the virtue she so good-naturedly misses from the earth in the eleventh novel of the heptameron margaret relates under altered names her adventure at the hunting lodge of bonnevet she introduces herself a lady of so good a family that there could be no better a widow living with her brother who loved her dearly who was himself a great lord and husband of a daughter of the king this young prince was greatly subject to his desires loving the chase pastimes and dances as youth requires and he had a very tiresome wife the poor wholly neglected consumptive claude whom his pastimes did not please at all wherefore this prince always took about with his wife his sister who was of a joyous life and was the best company possible though at the same time a good woman and respectable a gay and pious lady loving to laugh though a princess and truly chaste a widow young en bon point and of a very good constitution very strong young and beautiful living joyously in all society so amiable to her admirers that she cannot complain of their insults lest she should be supposed to have encouraged them yet she goes with her head in the air knowing the surety of her honour and many women 
who lead a far austerer life than she, have not her virtue. All through the heptameron the same traits recur, the light-heartedness and free manners, the real virtue, the good nature and worldliness. Sometimes, it is true, this great lady is spoken of as frequenting religious houses, and she is always awake to the existence of a more spiritual life than her own. But above all things, she is forte de bonne complexion de joyeuse vie. This robustness of temper, this love of life, of health, strength, joy, splendor, this absorbing delight in physical and material details is perhaps of all attributes the most exclusively Gaelic. Rabelais and Balzac exemplify it in the highest degree. It is the especial flavor and quality of France. Margaret possessed it, singularly blended with a sincere but vague mysticism, and this robust naturalness is the foundation of her whole character. All natural virtues are hers. She is kindly, affectionate, impulsively generous and compassionate. For herself, she fears suffering, so she would not let another suffer. Yet, as she herself would die in torture for Francis, so, if necessary, she would exact from others a like sacrifice for him. Of abstract justice she has no ideal, neither of other abstract qualities, honor, decency, morality, virtues that have been invented for the greater safety of the race. For all her mysticism, she has little sympathy with unembodied ideas. It is not that she is less virtuous than her neighbors, but her virtue takes a different turn. She and the Spaniards, whose influence is spreading far and wide, take their stand on different moralities. They stab their unfaithful wives and burn their heretics in gangs. To Margaret, infidelity is tolerable, but not fanaticism. Murder, and not loose morals, excites her horror. Her respect for life is stronger than her respect for any moral code. And with all its limitations, this gift of actuality was the one most needed by the age in which she lived. Born prematurely in the Dauphin's court, the seventeenth century was drawing on apace. The seventeenth century, with its moonstruck romance, its genius for mathematics, its conflict of science and superstition, its perversities of torture and fanaticism. Loyola is already the general of the new society of Jesus. The Guises are already grown. Already at the court of the king sits white and black as a moon in the clouds the relentless beauty of Diana. Diana, panoplied in her incestuous respectability, Diana, the would-be disinheritor of her Huguenot children, Diana, to whom form is all and nature nothing, already under her fair white bosom throbs the unnatural pulse of the age to come. End of section 20section twenty one of margaret of angouleme queen of navarre by agnes mary francis robinson this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter fifteen downfall fifteen forty four to fifteen forty five no sooner were the overtures to peace begun than martin de guzman the emperor's confessor and the king's mistress madame de tampes met to discuss between themselves the provisions of the treaty each was eager to secure a personal advantage from it de guzman the glory of a triumph over heresy and madame de tampes a place of shelter when the king should be no more for many a weary month the pretty cowardly distracted duchess had revolved her plans and found no safety from the wrath to come when Henry and Diana should reign. Bitterly she remembered the years of insults that she had heaped on La Vieille, as she had nicknamed the Dauphin's beautiful goddess, 
and she remembered her open antagonism to the victorious emperor. And even now she could not stay her bitter tongue. Day after day added some new revilement to the list, for she could not bring herself to repent, and since she would not amend, she must endeavor to escape. Anne de Pisleu was a Huguenot in politics, and it was believed that she shared the new ideas. But when de Guzman demanded the suppression of heresy, we do not hear that she made any opposition. On her side she demanded a court out of France, and a princely revenue for her young champion, the Duke of Orléans, a place for her to fly to and live in safety and brilliance when Francis should be dead. Let de Guzman settle this with his master, and she would answer for the scourging of the heretics. Then each of these honorable negotiators went to his work. The monk to his imperial penitent, the pretty duchess to her king. Each carried the point, for each had bargained for a thing his master specially desired. The heretics were as odious to the most Christian Charles as to the Dominican himself. Not many years were to elapse before the emperor should take the cowl, and the monkish temper was already strong in him. Moreover, not only from motives of faith, but for reasons of policy he wished to subdue the Lutherans. Since the Treaty of Schmalkalt in 1530, the Protestants of Germany had grown too strong. Anxious to avert an open rebellion, Charles had granted the Treaty of Nuremberg, allowing liberty of conscience to the Lutherans, and the remembrance of this concession was a thorn in his flesh. Since then also the Protestants had gained in strength. They would be hard subjects to master. Yet till he had them at his feet, Charles could not be absolutely sure of his tenure. The League of Lutheran Cities was strong. It included Constance, Nuremberg, Ulm, Strasbourg, and Heilbronn with eight other rich imperial towns backed by the states of Saxony, Hesse, Brandenburg, Anhalt, and the two Luneburgs. Charles, ever long-sighted and keen, trembled lest the kings of France and England should join this Protestant confederation. Henry VIII had already shaken off the yoke of the church. Francis was already too well with the Lutherans, constantly irritated by the Sorbonne, constantly influenced by his semi-Lutheran sister. It was possible that he might dare the wrath of the Church and of the Empire to make the head of a league which should include both the Protestants and Soliman. Fatally blind to the larger interests of his kingdom, Francis, too, saw cause for gratulation in the peace. Firstly, it secured the Milanese, or, at worst, the Netherlands, the treaty also rid the kingdom of two powerful armies drawn up within a few leagues of Paris. However confident the Dauphin might be in his successful generalship, Francis knew very well that Paris had hitherto been saved not by the Dauphin, but by the disunion between the Emperor and Henry the Eighth. The treaty would free his kingdom of their dangerous conjunction, and it would bring many advantages to the court a glorious provision for young Charles, a surcease from trouble to the king whose wife lay in a nervous fever while her brother made war on her husband. Her dangerous illness had touched her kind-hearted, the one faithful consort. He could not but remember how much he owed this nervous and saddened woman. Anne de Pisleu, who was not so patient under disappointment, would be satisfied. And what, after all, would Francis resign? his word of honor, his influence in Europe, his independence, and the glory of his people. But none of these things can be seen or weighed. None of them can be kept without continual struggle. Francis was old and tired. He found peace and plenty preferable to them all. So, on the 18th of September, 1544, Charles and Francis met at Crepy in Launois, Madame d'Etampes and Martin de Guzman, doubtless among the attendant company. Between the king and the emperor lay the treaty, yet unsigned. By its provisions, the emperor ceded to the young Duke of Orléans, at the expiration of two years, either his daughter Mary with the Netherlands, 
or Anne, his niece, dowered with the Milanese. The king on his side promised to bestow upon his second son a yearly revenue of a hundred thousand livres, secured on Bourbon, Orléans, Angoulême, and Châtellerault. In case these duchies did not yield the sum desired, that of Alençon should be taken from the much-enduring Margaret and added to the list. All mutual conquests since the Treaty of Nice were to be restored. It was further provided that the king should renounce his alliance with Soliman II and withdraw his protection from the Protestant princes of Germany, and that he should undertake to subdue the power of the Turks and arrest the progress of heresy. So ran the treaty, with its promises of gold and treason. The king and the emperor read it through, first one signed it, then the other. From that moment the influence of Spain was paramount in Europe. France was no longer a rival. From that moment the Inquisition triumphed, and that treaty authorized the Vaudois massacres and decided the doom of the twelve hundred Huguenot gentlemen of Amboise. The knife was ground then that should serve to stab Coligny and the signal given for the slaughter of St. Bartholomew and at the same time the political influence of france was destroyed she was made to ruin herself in the eyes of her natural allies in reducing france to the condition of an imperial province charles could afford to promise the king a governorship for his younger son so the short war ended in far more perilous amity all celebrated the occasion with rejoicings francis leonor the young duke even margaret herself margaret the champion of the oppressed in a long poem to her brother she entreats him not to forget in suppressing heresy to reform the church she sings a paean strange in her mouth over the triumph of the holy church and the reunion of charles and francis no words are rich enough to express her rapture all other good or gain compared to this appears imperfect and she concludes this peace is of god we are very sure little did margaret divine over what graves she was chanting her hymns of victory the dauphin alone was angry and suspicious his vanity as a general his jealousy of his brother were cruelly stung by this treaty which closed a fortunate campaign with an ignoble truce and gave the gain of the war to the duke of orleans and all the loss to france gathering his nobles round him at fontainebleau he signed a solemn act of protest witnessed by the count of anguien and the duke of guise though no high motives illumined him at least he saw the iniquity of this treaty and did his utmost to prevent it but there was no one to listen to him the king was hunting at romorantin the queen of navarre was writing stories in her castle at alencon very soon the treaty began to bear its natural fruit this treaty which margaret praised in prose and verse this pact of treason and derogation which she declared should give peace not to us alone but to all christendom whom the gods doom first they madden surely some lunacy of vain belief infected france that day when she signed away her independence among such rejoicings surely some craze had filmed the brain of the tolerant queen of navarre when laying will and conscience and judgment at her brother's feet she praised the infamy which doomed so many innocent to death the peace was signed on the eighteenth of september no sooner was the king pledged in the cause of the inquisition than cardinal de tournon began to supplicate him to exterminate the vaudois from his kingdom and by the first of january the king was convinced who were these vaudois this tiny people springing from lyon in the twelfth century and settled among the valleys of the alps of piedmont this scanty timid herd of mountain folk for whose destruction the inquisition was invented they were indeed a remnant pursued with fire and sword from their earliest days burned alive in the twelfth century hacked to death in the thirteenth suffocated by hundreds under francis i roasted slowly tortured hurled like stones down the mountains 
slaughtered in every diabolic fashion through the whole diabolic seventeenth century yet still surviving unobtrusive and gentle as ever with their simple faith and their plain humble worship unexterminated by the cruelty of ages one peter de waldo a merchant of lyons is said to be the ancestor of their faith before his death in eleven seventy this man one of the numerous reformers who preceded the reformation had impressed the people of lyons with his pure and noble faith after his death the sect flourished and in the thirteenth century it was found necessary to invent the inquisition to destroy it in his history of popular pantheism m auguste junt has printed a singular account of the vaudois left by etienne de belleville a dominican who had charge of this inquisition of twelve thirty three they absolutely refuse the inquisitor relates to obey the roman church which they call the impure babylon of the apocalypse for them all good men are priests having received from god the ordination which ecclesiastics receive from men they teach that it is sufficient to confess to god and that god alone has the right to excommunicate splendid and difficult saying often enough must the innocent and persecuted vaudois have laid this precept in sore extremity to heart god alone has the right to excommunicate and proceeds de belleville they believe not in prayers for the dead since for them purgatory is only in this life ah etienne de belleville worthy inquisitor do you believe that any dogma could declare more crucial sufferings to purify a tainted soul than those with which you visited those vaudois on earth what else to them indeed did you make their life but one long purgatory one perpetual fear and horror one lasting torment for them purgatory is in this world alone they reject alike oaths and lies they deny the right to execute justice or to make war except on evil spirits they allow meat on fast days and work on saints days for according to them there are no other saints than good men and women here on earth likewise they hold it for a sin to adore the cross or the body of christ or to pay peter's pence they call rich priests the children of the devil and refuse to consider the church or churchyard a holier place than other ground for they say the whole earth is equally blessed of god they mock the singing of hymns and the tapers burning before the holy images and the days when churches and altars are consecrated they call in derision the holy days of stones every good and holy man they say is the son of god even as christ himself they acknowledge the incarnation nativity passion and resurrection of christ but by this they understand the conception birth and spiritual resurrection of the man made perfect through penitence for them the true passion of jesus is the martyrdom of the just and the veritable sacrament is the conversion of man for in that manner is made the body of christ nevertheless they differ much among themselves according as they be more or less attainted by these errors nearly all agree that the soul of every good man is the holy spirit that is to say god but there are some among them of less evil sentiments whose error is that every worthy man can make the body of christ in the eucharist in pronouncing the words prescribed i have seen one such heretic in the flames who placed before the altar believed herself able to consecrate the bread and wine and she a woman i have heard a mother and daughter attainted with these same errors although not of one mind on certain points make proof of a profound knowledge of the propositions they defended both of them were burned it will be seen that these persecuted vaudois had much in common with the modern sect of quakers like their younger and more fortunate brethren they would not swear and would not lie war was no less to them than murder they believed in no hierarchy but only in the inspiration of the holy ghost and for holding these tenets they were slaughtered and tormented throughout five centuries like the quakers the vaudois were a quiet even a timid people they did not seek the notice or the glory of the world the life they loved the best was that of their lonely alpine valleys 
the simple days of shepherding among the fairy haunted hills the evenings when the head of every house read in his own dialect the bible to his assembled children the bursting of the flowers in spring flowers which the fontines the vaudois fairies watch and water every day until they blow the long days out on the hills in summer when the cattle are led to the upper meadows the cheerful harvest when all work together fathers sons daughters and mothers and the mother sets her baby's cradle among the standing corn for the fairies to guard during her absence for the fairies to rock and sing to sleep and to brush the flies from his forehead with their gauzy wings lastly the bitter winter when the whole household sit in the stables for warmth while the father reads the psalms and the women sing songs of elves and fairies they are still left some of the vaudois fairy songs innocent charming little ballads as simple as nursery rhymes it is strange to find them so sweet and harmless among the gaunt and horrible memories of crime slaughter and agony with which the inquisition has seared the pleasant vaudois meadows they are more touching than any tale of martyrdom these happy childish little songs which sprang up so sweetly in the gentle vaudois hearts two of them shall stand here and remind us of the life these quiet people led in their interval of quiet before the early spring of fifteen forty five for many years there had been peace true that in fifteen forty the cardinal de tournon had secured a writ condemning the head of every household to flame and sword but before the fearful execution had been carried out the good william du bellay had obtained a reprieve and the quiet of the green vaudois valleys was still unspotted and calm by their children's cots the mothers sang and the maidens sang over their churning and spinning the old sweet monotonous fairy songs sometimes the young voices sang in question and answer one would take the fairy's part what are you doing here you fair little bride and the sister would answer i have lost my way i have torn my frock beside i have lost my way in the gorse it tore my feet and never never i'll reach the village street and the first voice would ring out clear again come little shepherdess come it is not near yet reach your hand and come along my dear or in her long solitudes when all the household was out of doors and she alone in the dark little house with the baby at her breast the mother would sing a strange little song of the vaudois mountains with their mists and rainbows and clouds that suddenly blot the fields from sight and as suddenly pass away of course it is all in fairy guise twas i who saw the fairy she stood and spread around her misty skirts in vapour on the crests of bariound wherever the fairy wandered a serpent went as well a rainbow-coloured serpent on the summit of castel like traveller's joy and blossom like snow upon the pass she drifted o'er the mountain nor ever touched the grass now all my sheep had rambled come hither up the steep come hither cried the fairy and i will find the sheep a timid gentle visionary race they lived in their secluded upland valleys thankful when the cruel world forgot them for a time a race of shepherds and martyrs not of heroes they could not do battle for their faith and wrestle for centuries with a stronger power like the indomitable huguenot of la rochelle they could not fight but they could suffer and their mild persistence it was impossible to subdue in fifteen thirty the tidings of the reform had penetrated into these quiet valleys the vaudois heard with delight that the faith which they had held through pain and death for centuries had arisen stronger and more able in the crowded world outside they opened a correspondence with Boutser and Farel, and in fifteen thirty six they formally gave in their adhesion to the church of geneva thus the vaudois thought to strengthen their position to make themselves more redoubtable to their enemies and to avoid the introduction of strange doctrines into their belief for they remembered still how in the thirteenth century the insidious pantheism of amare de ben had won nearly half the vaudois from their early faith they took geneva for a standard and defence in reality by allying themselves with the reform they made themselves doubly obnoxious in the eyes of rome 
since that year of fifteen thirty six the cardinal de tournon had kept an angry watch upon them in fifteen forty he nearly gained his ends there were at that moment ten thousand vaudois households the cardinal believed he had made a good bag but before the writ could be carried out francis had projected his alliance with the port in which case he would need to conciliate the german lutheran princes the king willingly let himself be led by du bellay into cancelling the writ he had no natural taste for murder and he was glad to let these vaudois live these vaudois whom the good king louis the twelfth had declared to be better christians than himself but as soon as the treaty of crepy was signed the cardinal saw his chance political necessity no longer bound the most christian king to curry favour with heretics on the contrary he was pledged to conciliate spain to forward the holy office of the inquisition a campaign against the vaudois would push his chances not only in heaven but on earth thus argued the cardinal not without effect and about christmas time he clinched his argument with a most plausible and likely proof of treachery on the part of this nest of heretics they were not only heretics but most contumacious rebels so the cardinal affirmed and he assured the king of a plot laid among them discovered by d'oped the fanatic governor of provence to seize the city of marseilles and make it a centre for heresy and rebellion it is scarcely possible that either francis or the cardinal could have believed these simple shepherds capable or even anxious to secure a town which had defied the greatest strength of france and spain the plea was absurd but it suited the purpose of the cardinal to affect belief in it and the king had not the courage to contradict him william du bellay had died the year before margaret was away at alencon and de tournon was at hand the king was weak ill sorely in need of peace and quiet he felt that a proof of his devotion to the catholic faith was really desirable after his clemency at la rochelle and his alliance with the turks by the treaty of crepy he was bound to crush out heresy and if the treaty were not carried out there would be no milanese for charles besides if these people were rebels and heretics they deserved a punishment so the king let himself be fatally persuaded to a crime which casts an ever-lengthening horror on his name on new year's day he signed the writ it was a revocation he was told the king did not read it but he signed his name it was more difficult to procure the other necessary signatures the secretary of state refused he was not old and ill and weak he had no younger son to place he could afford a conscience and refused the cardinal made l'obispin sign instead it was necessary also that the procureur du roi should sign it he refused his substitute refused the chancellor's signature must also witness the writ and he again refused the cardinal set a chance seal to it and gave it to the messenger of the parliament of provence who stood waiting for it at the door when the president d'oped read the paper he found it better than a mere revocation of the pardon of fifteen forty one for the writ of fifteen forty had merely condemned to death the head of every household confiscated the property of the heretics ordered every house to be razed every orchard to be uprooted every tree to be burned as accursed but this new writ which the king had never read condemned all to death alike all men and women children and babies at the breast the heretics were to be exterminated root and branch d'oped no sooner received the writ than swiftly and silently he marched upon the seventeen vaudois villages several of them were situate in the papal territory of avignon but he easily procured permission to invade them in so good a cause d'oped marched on at the head of a strange and ferocious army they were the soldiers from the galleys whom he led a fierce and reckless crowd yet even they paused when they discovered that no war but sheer slaughter was before them d'oped had at first some difficulty in cheering them on to the general pillage slaughter and rapine but having once tasted blood they entered into the spirit of their crusade they began by destroying cabriere and merindol with fire 
all that ran out of the flames were cut down by the soldiery. In one church, four hundred women and children who had sheltered there were slaughtered in one day. The rude galley soldiers learned new devices and caprices in the art of murder. They discovered a thousand ways to send a heretic to hell. On they marched, leaving behind them smoking ruins and uprooted orchards, skeletons and corpses, where they had found the pious shepherds content in their fairy-haunted homes. The poor Fantine must have fled aghast from this new world of flames and shrieking. No home was safe, even under the earth the soldiers found their victims in the deep recesses of the mountain caves. The Vaudois, it seemed, were silenced for ever. Even the Cardinal de Tournon was satisfied, and from the whole of Europe went up a tremendous shout of praise or blame. Spain praised loudly, Spain continually persecuting two entire nations, the Jews and the Moors, Spain, whose autos daily sent the smoke of their human sacrifice to the blue heaven, whose inquisition in forty years condemned over forty thousand heretics, whose army in one year, 1570, sent fifty thousand Moors to death or slavery, Spain, the cruel, pure-eyed fanatic, piously setting a world in flames for the greater glory of God, Spain applauded. But Switzerland, Germany, England, the natural allies of France shrank back from her in horror. The Treaty of Crepy had already done its worst. France was France no longer. France, which in 1543 could afford to say, For the last thousand years and more I have been the haven and refuge of the afflicted and oppressed, France in 1545 became a mere feeble copy and hanger-on of Spain. Meanwhile, France herself was sorely divided. The Cardinal de Tournon, the Sorbonne, and its adherents triumphed. Margaret must have wept, I think, though strangely enough we possess no letter of hers interceding for the hunted Vaudois. Perhaps in her northern castle she did not hear the news until too late. The king, we may be sure, would keep silence. Perhaps remembering the treaty just witnessed, she knew that she had lost the right to intercede. Perhaps believing de Tournon's report, she thought of these Vaudois not as martyrs but as rebels who would wage a civil war against her brother, and for her brother's sake she could be very hard. We remember the marriage of the brave little Jeanne, and we know that Margaret had no mercy in her heart for those who questioned the authority of the king. But in any case, she must have been most miserable whether because her brother's kingdom seemed crumbling to ashes in his hand, or because of a cruel, unnecessary sacrifice of innocent lives, a sacrifice that once she might have prevented, and which she had no longer the influence to prevent. These must have been wretched days to Margaret, for her life, it appeared, had been used in vain. The king himself was aghast, ashamed. When the tidings of the massacre reached him, he sent for Doped, and it required all the influence of de Tournon to save that violent baron from a violent end. Francis declared that his commands had been cruelly exceeded, and though Dopet escaped with his life, he left the court a disgraced and branded man. The ruins of the Vaudois villages were still warm and smoking, the eagles and vultures still swooped down on the unburied corpses in the trampled Vaudois meadows, the fierce autumn heats, made that place of desolation a place of pestilence and danger still when francis and his favourite son the duke of orleans for whose sake all these things were done set out for boulogne to make one last effort to recover the port from the english before signing the treaty with henry the eighth the plague ravaged the french and english camps so that more than a hundred soldiers died every day in the huddled army before boulogne there was no time to dig graves for the dead. With a terrible sang-froid, the sick were laid together in thatched huts outside the camp, and then when all were dead, the walls and roofs were battered down over the corpses, and this was all their burial. No wonder that the dreadful sickness spread throughout the country. Having arrived at forêt a little town close to Abbeville, the young Duke of Orléans was not pleased with the quarters allotted to him for the night. 
in the same house he found a finer suite of rooms and was about to establish himself in them when the host in great alarm begged him to go back to his old lodging for in the rooms which he had chosen several people had lately died of the plague well and good cried charles never a son of france has died of the pest and laughing at the horror of his host this madcap youth called to his companions to come and show how little he was afraid the wild young nobles drew their swords and tossing on their rapiers the infected pillows of the bed they played at ball till the feathers flew all over the room and covered the rash players as with snow aghast the host looked on in the doorway when night came on the young duke retired to rest in this infected chamber about two hours later he awoke with violent thirst and pains in his head and limbs i am ill he cried it is the plague and i shall die he then asked for a glass of water for two or three days he lay in thirst in pain and delirium francis lay in another chamber of that house ill with anxiety and fatigue but on the third day the duke recovered consciousness and earnestly requested to see his father the message was taken and francis rose from his bed and declared that he would go the cardinal de tournon remonstrated in vain urging that the fever was fatally contagious but francis was not to be moved from his purpose he entered the chamber of his son alone the young duke haggard exhausted could not raise himself upon his pillows but he bade his attendants lift him up and stretching out his arms to the poor half-fainting king he cried ah sire i am dying but now that i see you again i die content the effort was too much the duke fell back on his pillow too weak to utter another word in a few minutes he was dead and the king stricken as by a thunderbolt was carried from the room in a swoon it was the thirteenth of september fifteen forty five so ended the fair promises of crepy exactly one year and ten days after the signing of the treaty exactly a year before any benefit could have accrued to france therefrom End of section twenty one section twenty two of margaret of angouleme queen of navarre by agnes mary francis robinson this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 16. Nerac in 1545. While mourning and remorse filled the court of France, the little court of Nerac had settled into the inactive peace of disillusion. Even the sanguine king believed no more in the promise of Francis to restore his kingdom even the visionary queen could hope no longer for the reconciliation of the church with luther age with its calms and compromises was settling over navarre margaret with every year becoming more estranged from her husband with every year more resigned to this estrangement occupied herself with good works she spent the greater part of her income and in pensions to the poor of her kingdom charging herself with a little nation of orphans of afflicted of aged and decrepit persons whose living she provided she sent large sums also to the lutheran refugees in switzerland and germany on herself she spent very little the black dress edged with fur the pleated white chemisette which she had assumed on the death of her baby son was a fashion from which she had never since departed her hair neatly put away beneath a nun-like coif her figure fuller now than in her youth in its tightly fitting sober garb her face blond and placid with its wistful smile so we know her in the portrait of jeannet her court painter and brother of the greater jeannet and she seems to us like some calm and gentle abbess ruling rather a convent than a court it was indeed a quiet and orderly existence which she led supervising her charities ordering her household maintaining an immense correspondence in the afternoons as she sat at her broidery a work in which she excelled she kept two secretaries by her side one on the right took down her letters from her dictation 
and the other wrote the verses she made aloud from time to time in the pauses of her other work. The mass of poems thus composed, fluent, inconsequent, empty as the verse of an improvisatore, was at this time being set ready for publication, and appeared in 1547 under the title of Les Marguerites de la Marguerite des Princesses. Here we find not only her early spiritual verses, not only the Mirouet, which so excited the wrath of the Sorbonne, and which Elizabeth of England translated, not only the charming rondeau and ballads written to the king in captivity, but verse of a much later date. Margaret had never been so busy with her pen as now that her active influence was in abeyance. In 1542 she had written La Coche, a subtle dissertation on the best way of loving, which the praise of Francis inspires for a moment with true poetry and pathetic fervor. In 1544 she had completed the Heptameron, and now she was busy writing and revising a whole accumulation. Spiritual songs, with a certain faded pathos in them, charming and not quite sincere, long meditations, prayers and triumphs of affluent learned piety, well supplied with texts, innocent boarding-school farces, on marriage, on faith as the best physician, on too much plenty, little and less, a sort of insipid rhymed proverbs, not devoid of a pleasant feminine substitute for humor, also, strange in the midst of these, a savage, passionate outburst against the cruelty of the Inquisition, and bound up with all this medley of old-fashioned piety and sisterly devotion, a series of four mysteries, interspersed by exquisite and charming pastorals. Of these mysteries, or comedies, as Margaret prefers to call them, that on the nativity far excels the three others, the desert, the innocence, and the adoration of the kings. Nothing more delicate, more sweetly fantastic than this strange light little comedy, this religious operetta. Joseph sings a tripping sort of vaudeville to welcome the holy babe, and then the scene shifts and the bergerie begins. The shepherds and shepherdesses of Palestine are sitting on the grass at evening, watching their folded flocks. They relate the work of the day to each other, and then lie down to sleep, all in a sort of song when one of them remarks the unusual brightness of the stars. At this point appears a choir of singing angels who tell of the birth of Christ. Then, when the heavenly voices all are hushed, the wondering youths and maidens sing a Noel, charming in its light, swift touch and dancing meters. Chorus of Shepherds and Shepherdesses Come, let us hasten, journeying, to see the child and mother bright, of whom the angels caroling have sung sweet homilies to-night sing noel let the noel ring for christ is given to us outright sophronius and philatine to their poor household let us bring of all our store a bounteous freight dorothy this cheese shall be my plenishing in frame of rushes neatly dight chorus sing noel let the noel ring for Christ is given to us outright. Christia, and I for Mary's nourishing have milk new drawn and creamy white. Philatine, I'll give my cage, therein shall sing my bird to please her, and it might. Chorus, sing Noel, let the Noel ring, for Christ is given to us outright. El Pison, these faggots of my gathering shall warm them in their wintry plight. Nefle, my flute shall be my offering, the child shall hear it with delight. Chorus. Sing Noel, let the Noel ring, for Christ is given to us outright. Sophronius. I'll run upon their heralding, for I the best know wrong from right. Philatine. His face I'll kiss in worshipping. Christia. Oh no, the heel's too holy quite. Chorus. Sing Noel, let the Noel ring, for Christ is given to us outright. These charming comedies were acted at Nérac with other farces less innocent and pretty. Pour nous divertir, nous faisons moinerie et farce, writes Margaret, and these monkeries, of which the inquisitor alone remains, were, 
we may well believe conceived in the spirit of Marot's frère Lubin. They, in her patronage of Lutheran refugees, brought Margaret into such disrepute with the Catholic party that an attempt was made to poison her at her own table. And one day, Henry of Navarre, it is said, weary of these continual troubles, boxed his illustrious consort on the ears, exclaiming, Madame, you want to know too much. It was difficult for Margaret to satisfy at once her husband, her brother, her Lutheran teachers, and her own liberal conscience. Sometimes that credulous and tolerant conscience led her sorely astray. In this year of 1545, she sheltered in her hospitable court two would-be Lutherans, dressed as monks, named Canton and Puck. These men speedily rose to eminence at Nerac. Their vague spiritualism, their insidious, amorous mysticism, was quite to the taste of the little court there. Margaret, ever dense and now quite bewildered by a long experience of gallantry and mysticism, saw nothing to blame in their tenets. But after some while, Calvin at Geneva, hearing of these new lights of Navarre, made inquiries. He was scandalized when he learned the truth. These men, the principals of the infamous sect of libertines or brothers of the free spirit, had been exiled from state to state, shunned by all for their impious and monstrous doctrines, for the debauchery and vice of their behavior. He wrote to the queen, his old protectress, and let her hear in no honeyed terms what were these ministers of hers. Then Canton and Polk, those prosperous refugees, had to be dismissed. But the spirit of moral relaxation, the vague mysticism which had tolerated their presence, could not be sent as easily away. For in the time of political emptiness, in the pause following the death of the Duke of Orléans, Margaret's spirit, no longer braced by the large air of the world's affairs, had become enervated and languid and dreamy. Her visionary disposition asserted itself more and more. Her imagination, so easily transported, dwelt more and more on subtleized religion and subtleized passion, fused into one strange, all-engrossing mood in that uncritical mind of hers. A pretty tale that Brantome tells of her at this time gives a sudden insight into this tender and unworldly attitude. I tell the story almost in Brantome's words. The brother of Brantome, Jean de Bourdet, destined in his youth for the church, had been sent to Ferrara, then almost a French colony under the Duchess René of France, to finish his studies. There he met a charming young French widow, Madame de la Roche, with whom the young seminarist fell passionately in love. He threw up his career, and bringing his lady to the shelter of Margaret's court at Nerac, set off to the wars in Piedmont. Six months afterwards, Captain de Bourdet returned. His first visit was to Pau, where his mother was, and also the Queen of Navarre. He met the Queen coming out of church after Vespers. She, la meilleure princesse du monde, turned, and led him into the deserted church. There, for some time, they talked together, walking to and fro, speaking of Italy, Piedmont, of the wars, but not a word of Madame de la Roche. Suddenly, Marguerite stopped, and seizing the hand of Bourdet, she said in a changed voice, My cousin, do you feel nothing move beneath your feet? No, madame, he replied. But think well, my cousin, she insisted. I have thought, madame, but nothing moves, for a firm flagstone is underneath my feet. Then I will tell you, said the queen, you are over the tomb and the body of that poor young Madame de la Roche, who is buried here beneath you and whom you loved so much. And since our souls still feel after our death, you must not doubt that this honest creature, dead for your sake, felt a thrill as soon as you stepped upon her grave and if you did not feel it because of the thickness of the tomb, you must not doubt but it was real. And since it is a pious office to hold the dead in memory, and even those whom one has loved, I pray you to give her a paternoster, an Ave Maria, and a De Profundis, and to sprinkle her with holy water, and thus you will acquire the name of a very faithful lover and a good Christian. I will leave you then for that and go away." 
in such a mood as this tenderly cynical melancholy dreamy margaret ruled over her court of navarre in these latter days of general désouvrement which followed on the death of charles of orleans End of section twenty two Section twenty three of Margaret of Angouleme, Queen of Navarre, by Agnes Mary Frances Robinson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter seventeen Death of the King, fifteen forty five to fifteen forty seven. The Queen of Navarre looks very delicate, wrote Marino Cavalli in fifteen forty two so delicate i fear she has not long to live yet she is so sober and moderate that after all she may last she is i think the wisest not only of the women but of the men in france no one knows more than she either of the conduct of state affairs or of the secrets of religion but i fear she is nigh to death with every year she had grown a little weaker but still she was alive so long as her brother lived margaret believed she could not die nor continue living after his decease in this winter of fifteen forty five she was far from him in bearn tortured with rheumatism sleeplessness and fever weakening with the slow consumption that wore away her life but all her thoughts were for francis she did not complain sitting between her two secretaries dictating her letters to the one and to the other her stories or her verses but they could tell when her pain was hard to bear for she would start up crying i fear the king is worse and anxiously look out along the snowy roads to see if any courier were on the way from paris so firmly convinced was her loving heart that she and her brother held their lives and sufferings in common indeed the king was very ill that year he could not rest in that palace which it had been the great business of his life to adorn he found no consolation now in the fair tables with histories right finely wrought which only a few years ago he had shown with such leisurely triumph and delight to the astounded valoup he could not sleep now in the royal bedchamber which wrote valoup i do assure your majesty is very singular as well with antiquel borders as with costly ceiling and chemney and when he walked in the gallery where were cellini's statues and primaticcio's casts the most magnificent gallery i had ever seen with betwixt every window great antiquel personages standing entier doubtless king francis remembered how he had shown these treasures also a little while ago to his good friend and guest and brother-in-law the emperor all of francis's life was poisoned by his enmity of charles he laid plans and schemes for beginning the war again and on a grander scale than heretofore between the winter of fifteen forty five and the winter of fifteen forty six he traversed the frontier of his kingdom inspecting every town in burgundy and champagne hurrying on the work of fortification himself distributing the necessary monies for war seemed imminent at any moment though francis weary and disheartened was readier for enmity than for actual battle but in the early spring of fifteen forty seven he received a shock which sent all thoughts of a campaign far from his spirit for the time on the twenty eighth of january henry of england died this news was a thunderbolt for francis who since the english treaty had slipped back into his old terms of friendship with his neighbour they were of the same age and the same constitution they had known each other from youth up each was gallant and frank though the lovable light-mindedness of francis incurred the contempt of henry's brutal strength and ever since the memorable day when francis had forced his way into the king of england's tent on the field of the cloth of gold the french king had entertained a true liking for his neighbour which outlasted many a sudden quarrel and breach of the peace in one profound sentence gaillard has condensed the relations of francis with his neighbours charles v 
greatly injured Francis and disliked him little. Francis hated him and loved Henry VIII, by whom he was hated and who was jealous of him. In the last days of January our English Henry died, and by the end of February Francis was seriously ill. He had contracted a slow fever which day by day consumed his long diminished strength. He tried to brace himself against its ravages, but the means he took to strengthen his frame only left it weaker. The chase, his lifelong passion, possessed him with redoubled craving at the last. He wandered from place to place, from province to province, hunting through all his forests all day long, himself all night a prey to agony and fever. Always ill, always weaker, always in the saddle, he led his weary court from Saint-Germain to La Mouette, thence to Villepreux and Dompierre, then on to Limousin, where he meant to pass the carnival. But after a rest of two or three days, his fever hunted him down. The air did not suit him in that place. In a milder atmosphere, he thought he might be stronger. So scarcely able to travel, he led his retinue to Loche in Touraine. He was no better. He was indeed so much weaker that for some time while he was compelled to sojourn there and when he was able to set out again he decided to turn his face homewards and made for Saint-Germain his favourite and usual resort. On the way thither he had to pass Rambouillet, where he determined to rest for a night. But on arriving there he remembered many a glorious day in youth, when he had hunted the boar through the forests round the castle. He ordered a great boar hunt for the morrow. The courtiers, with the Dauphin at their head, waited anxiously on that morning, wondering if the king would appear. The agonies that his abscess had caused him, the prostration that had laid him low at Lush, his unfixed, hesitating, and uncertain mind, all rendered it unlikely. But lo, down the great staircase comes the king, something of his old majesty in the poise of his unwieldy figure, and in his swollen, altered features, a little of their youthful grace and animation. It is as though the hero of Christendom, the Francis of Marignano and Pavia, were alive again, the Francis whose prowess in war and in the chase was the theme of every court in Europe. All day long this fair, deceitful mirage lasts. The horn winds, the hounds yelp, the hunters ride through the glades of the green forest, and Francis is first of all swiftest and most vigorous. Like a man under a charm, he feels neither fatigue nor anguish, neither the languor of his wasting fever nor the darting and throbbing of his wound. All day he hunts, but on returning to the castle he is so prostrate that he at once retires to sleep, a healthy fatigue, no doubt, in the morning he will be stronger. Alas, hour by hour his fever increased. The pangs of his internal wound became more and more intolerable. What expiation there may be in personal suffering was his at the last. No Vaudois suffered more than he that night, no Berguin in his chariot of fire. Suddenly all pain ceased. The abscess had begun to mortify and his physicians announced to Francis that he had not many hours to live. Francis thereupon sent for the Dauphin, and commended his kingdom to him in words so wise and sober, they make us marvel the monarch ruled no better who could advise so well. Never recall Montmorency, keep in check the Guises, diminish the taxes. Such were the dying counsels of the king, Councils that, if followed, would have averted twenty years of civil wars, the ruin of the Valois, and the massacre of St. Bartholomew. He also recommended the Cardinal de Tournon and Admiral Donbeau to the good offices of his son. And having rid himself of earthly cares, he died, a firm Catholic, free from pain at the last, on the 31st of March, 1547, in the fifty-third year of his age. It is with a shock that we find him still so young. During the last seven years of his life, 
he had been not merely old but superannuated more than a fortnight lapsed before margaret heard of her brother's death none dared to tell her of that last most dread calamity all winter long she had been ailing and in great distress about her brother her ladies often discovered her in tears and she would tell them that she feared the king was very ill and should he die she was sure she would not long survive him it was a severe winter so cold that for weeks together the delicate declining queen could not leave her special suite of rooms in the great castle of pau the deep snows retarded the arrival of the couriers from paris for whose coming margaret watched and feared and hoped all day and all night the close pent-up life the long suspense told heavily on her fragile constitution and deepened her consumptive taint with the breaking of the frosts margaret went from pau to the convent of toussaint in the angoumé in order to pass the season of lent in retreat among the nuns her constant and growing anxiety haunted her there no less than in the world the fasts and vigils of lent weakened her yet more and rendered her ever visionary brain peculiarly subject to dreams and hallucinations early in april she dreamed one night that the king came and stood by her bedside his face was pale and ghastly and in a thrilling anguished voice he called upon her twice my sister my sister margaret awoke in dismay she rose and forthwith dispatched her messengers to rochefort where she believed the king to be and during the anxious days of waiting that ensued she withdrew from the placid company of the nuns whose peace was a reproach to her feverish heart day after day and yet no answer came day after day for in truth the king was dead no one dared to tell his sister they knew her passionate affection and feared the stroke but the suspense all but cost the poor queen her reason a week after her messengers had gone and when the king had been a fortnight dead the same vision appeared to her in sleep this time margaret awoke almost distracted she sent for her attendants and questioned them earnestly almost fiercely they did not venture to leave her in so frenzied a mood and invented well-meaning lies among themselves assuring her the king was well was better much better only half convinced margaret rose and having dispatched another messenger passed toward the convent chapel she was still in the cloisters giving a last direction to her secretary when she heard from a distant corner of the cloister a sound of very bitter weeping margaret ever compassionate went swiftly to the place her secretary and some of her attendants following her on the step of the cloister sat a poor crazy nun a harmless gentle creature allowed to roam the convent at her will she sat there poor innocent weeping so violently that her sobs echoed far and wide through the resounding cloister margaret came up to the distracted mourner what is it my sister said the queen that you deplore at the sound of that gentle voice the poor demented girl stopped her weeping she looked up and said for you madame i weep for you then rising swiftly to her feet she covered her face in the folds of her veil and fled from the spot the queen stayed there rigid and still as stone she had grown very white then turning to her attendants god she said at last has revealed to me through this poor mad woman what you would vainly conceal the king is dead without tears or more ado she sought her chamber and kneeling on the floor dwelt long and earnestly in prayer she sought no human help or sympathy she only entreated to be left alone that prayer should be granted henceforth indeed the loving ardent sister should be quite alone while margaret was kneeling on the floor of her convent cell weeping for her loss and praying for her dead brother her brother passionately loved and desperately mourned the court of france with the dauphin at its head scarcely cared to conceal its rejoicing the old regime was quickly buried away 
Queen Leonor prepared to leave her land of exile and retire to her own familiar home of Brussels. The Duchess d'Etampes was disgraced. The crown diamond which Francis had given her was taken from her and given to the triumphant Diana, and Anne herself was banished to her husband's castle and her husband's revengeful guardianship. De Tournon and Donbeau were dismissed the court. Montmorency was recalled, favors and honors were heaped upon him. He and the Guises were set at the head of affairs. The four hundred thousand crowns which Francis, despite his magnificence, had saved for the good of the state, was swiftly spent among the sombre favorites of Henry the Second. Never recall Montmorency, check the Guises, diminish the taxes, the dying king had said. Nor was this all. A terrible scene disgraced the royal funeral, a scene noticed by few, heard only by the nearest bystanders, but of which the reflection and the echo have survived until our time. The coffins of the Dauphin and of the young Duke Charles, not yet inhumed, were carried in one convoy with the kings to the royal vault at Saint-Denis. Francis and the two sons he loved made that last sad journey together, and Henry the new king, looking on as the solemn funeral wound along the streets before him, watched the procession with a significant smile. Pointing to the coffin of the Duke of Orléans, he leaned to one of his courtiers and asked, See that rascal? He opens the vanguard of my felicity. So unregretted, the king's funeral passes on. Guise and Diana laugh together quietly, but from the heart. He is gone, they say, the old gallant, and Henry enters into his felicity. Meanwhile at Toussaint, Margaret weeps and prays, and in Madrid the emperor surprises the messenger who brings him the news by an outburst of grief for the death of his captive of yore. He is gone, cries Charles, like Guise and Diana, but with how different an accent. He is gone, the great prince. I think that nature will not make his like again. Charles takes the loss to heart, even as Francis sorrowed for Henry of England. The news leaves him old and lusterless. He has lost his rival and his captive, his brother and his noblest adversary. Thus Francis rests at Saint-Denis between the coffins of his sons. His heir makes merry over his burial, and, relates Dondolo, who wrote from France that year, just so pallid and melancholy as he was, does he now seem cheerful and well-colored. The young Cardinal de Guise is the very heart and spirit of him, and negotiates all the state affairs with the king. So little were the counsels of Francis remembered. Only his sister mourns and weeps, she alone and the emperor who ruined him. End of section 23section twenty four of margaret of angouleme queen of navarre by agnes mary francis robinson this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eighteen the end fifteen forty seven to fifteen forty nine part one the king was dead but life still went on full of pressing needs and sordid complications margaret's belief had proved fallacious her brother was dead, and she was still alive. Nay, rich as was the past in dear and solemn memories, she had little time to brood on it. Never had the present called her with so urgent, vulgar, and clamorous a voice. For not only her brother was dead, but the king her patron. With him her royal pensions, her influence, her authority died too. And even in the first flush of her grief, Margaret had to set her mind to saving what she could from the general disaster. The death of her brother left her with scarcely sufficient money to cover her yearly expenses, for though her revenues were large, her generosity was larger. Spending little on herself, very little as we shall see, she had always chosen to give away the surplus, not to save it. Hitherto there had seemed small need for thrift, for Francis had always shared abundantly with his mignonne. 
now he was dead and margaret's expenses were greater than at any former time the young princess jeanne at this time a handsome and piquant brunette of seventeen was living at the court of francis fond of splendour and gaiety extravagant and wilful she maintained an almost royal establishment in paris her mother's letters are frequent to m Dizernay, the governor of jeanne's household and in all of them she beseeches him to check the ruining course of her thoughtless girl's expenditure for the king of navarre and i do find it insupportable and deem that it is impossible it should continue long since we have not the means to defray it and the said lord has told me that being at paris he found the expenses of my daughter marvellously great wherefore i warned you of it as i do again beseeching you monsieur Dizernay, to stay your hand for with the expenses that i have already i could not find the means to support this extra charge jeanne however does not appear to have made any retrenchments for in the ten months of the next year her housekeeping absorbed the whole of her mother's yearly pension twenty five thousand pounds tournois about two thousand one hundred english without counting her pin money three thousand two hundred and fifty pounds and the cost of her trousseau five thousand two hundred and thirteen pounds to the gay high-spirited charming girl at court ambitious and one of the prettiest princesses of her age the remonstrances of her mother appeared ignorant and ill-founded of course down in nerac it was difficult to understand the necessary expenses of a royal princess in paris so jeanne attempted to persuade her mother assuring margaret that she could not spare one of the officers of her household for her state was only the legitimate splendour of a fille à la suite de la cour meanwhile the very continuance of this pension which jeanne was so amply spending was yet undecided yet it is characteristic of margaret's generous temper that when at this anxious moment henry offered to liquidate a debt of four thousand eight hundred and eighty five pounds tournois which had been lent to his father by margaret and the duke of alencon margaret refused to receive the money and insisted that it should be paid to her dead husband's sisters the marchioness of montferrat and the duchess of vendome she was herself in great straits pressed by her urgent need she wrote from pau to m Dizernay, june thirteenth fifteen forty seven the king of navarre will leave on friday after the feast of st john and take his daughter back to court with him and i shall go to mont de marsan and keep house so thriftily that every one will stare it is not necessary that you should take the trouble to come to me just yet for reasons that i will tell you so soon as i am there and also because you do me a much greater service in soliciting my affairs at court of which the greatest is the assurance of my twenty five thousand pounds tournois for as you know without them it would be impossible for me to maintain my state and i have no more in reserve than will pay this year's expenses and one may well believe it is not my custom without sore necessity to ask any favour and if i had father mother brother uncle or kinsman i would pray them to be my advocates but since it has pleased the king henry the second to promise to be all these things to me it will not in any wise vex him that i demand his aid for without his grace and goodness i could not live at all having in this world no other wealth than that which the king francis i and he have given me and i have always been as content therewith as if i had had a great share of the revenues of my house henry confirmed the pension and asked margaret to stand sponsor to his new-born child treating her with a kindness and regard that would go far to endear his memory did we not suspect an aim in reserve an object which made it worth his while to conciliate margaret suspected nothing she was profoundly touched by his goodness and by a friendly and magnanimous letter which constable de montmorency had the fine tact to send her on his reinstatement in power that montmorency should be the advocate of the queen of navarre who had been the instrument of his fall 
was indeed a heaping of coals of fire upon her head she scarcely knew how sufficiently to confess her humility she wrote my nephew you will not find it strange if incessantly i thank you as you incessantly give me occasion for by the message this porter has brought me i see clearly that time has had no victory over your remembrance to be able to efface the affection that since your childhood i have borne you and the like i pray you to continue until the end of your old mother and be you to her the staff of her age as she was the rod of youth to you for you have had many friends but remember you have had but one mother who will never lose this name or character in all that she may do or desire for you or yours so margaret wrote to montmorency gratefully smiling through her tears and wrote to henry that he is the life health and repose of her spirit meanwhile montmorency under henry's orders was opening all the letters and packets addressed to the queen and king of navarre in search of complaint or a treasonable plan to frustrate the king's arrangement for their daughter's marriage henry had inherited his father's fears lest the king of navarre should marry his only daughter to the heir of spain it seemed so natural a match and one that would set so old a feud at rest that the king of france did not feel himself secure until jeanne of navarre was given to a husband of his choice france not spain must acquire navarre it was too dangerous an outpost to yield to the enemy therefore little jeanne had been taken away from her father and mother and brought up as a french princess therefore she had been married against her will to the duke of cleves since that marriage had been dissolved the old peril was nearer than before her gaiety and spirit gave a great charm to this girl known in paris as the darling of kings and her father had always ardently desired the spanish match henry determined to marry jeanne at once the husband that he chose for her was rich noble the son of her mother's dearest friend françoise d'alencon antoine de bourbon the duke of vendome held the first rank in france after the king's children if he were suspected of lutheran tendencies that was but another passport to the favour of the queen of navarre in choosing him for jeanne henry had done well by his little niece with her dowry of a poverty-stricken and confiscated kingdom yet margaret passionately opposed the match both she and her husband so disliked the mere thought of it that we are tempted to believe they had really set their hearts on philip of spain for their son-in-law henry of france certainly believed this and he was strenuous in urging on the bourbon marriage meanwhile the king of navarre too weak to openly oppose the plan impotently tried to shuffle out of it his nephew sent for him to paris but first he was detained at pau by the affairs of madame de laval then he was ill with a long intermittent illness which forced him to stay at home nobody believed much in these excuses and at last the king of france got hold of his shuffling and irresolute opposer then the affair was quickly decided the french king wrote to montmorency in letters that have something of the expression of his face after youth something embittered discordant and cynical i have got quit of him the king of navarre cheaper than i thought i grant him only fifteen thousand francs a year for the government of his kingdom that is less than i offered him by monge for if you remember i had offered him ten thousand crowns it is true there is no love lost between my good aunt and her husband never any couple were less united and she already far from loves her son-in-law the king of navarre will swear by nothing but the allegiance that he owes me and i trust his protestations just as much as i ought they are very poor i don't believe that altogether they have ten gentlemen in waiting the king has besought me to appoint him a lieutenant i said i would think of it it seems to me this is a very different thing from determining to choose one himself as he used to declare there is no further need that you should open the packets addressed to the king and queen of navarre 
After all, there is nothing to make it worth your while. The King of Navarre told me he knew very well that his wife was the cause of his not receiving all his packets. In these letters and fragments of letters we perceive the lessening authority of Margaret and her husband. Their opposition was not likely now to frustrate any plan of the king. Meanwhile, Jeanne was brilliantly happy. She had so little affection for her mother that Margaret's sorrow touched her not at all. She had made a brilliant marriage and had made it in France with a man of her own language and her own manners. These had ever been the chief of her ambition. Antoine de Bourbon was vacillating, uncertain, timid, but he was better than the Duke of Cleves. He was rich, amiable, of the highest rank. Jeanne set about the pleasant extravagances of her trousseau with a merry heart. I never saw so happy a bride, said Henry the Second to Montmorency. Meanwhile, Margaret continued her unaccountable opposition. She was deeply attached to Jeanne, but her daughter's happiness did not change her. Perhaps she foresaw how little fitted was the vacillating and fickle temper of Vendôme to guide her daughter's headstrong, courageous nature, more likely the long depression which took possession of her on her brother's death rendered her incapable of pleasure. It was sorely against her will that she joined the French court at Lyon, proceeding thence to Moulins, where, on the 20th of October, 1548, Jeanne d'Albret, the future mother of Henry IV, was married. The festival, though not so fine as that which graced the unlucky nuptials of the Duke of Cleves, was still a splendid sight, celebrated avec toute espèce de festin, joyeuseté et pompe royale. The King of France was present, the Duke of Vendôme, though at the last thinking with disrelish of Jeanne's earlier bridal, showed himself a generous lover and settled one hundred thousand pounds tournois upon the bride. Jeanne was as merry as her marriage bells, yet Margaret persisted in her displeasure, and only at her nephew's express command would affix her signature to the marriage contract. The King of Navarre suddenly content to be outwitted at so good a price. Margaret, miserable, dejected, angry with her husband, and lavishing unanswered love upon her girl. Jeanne, thoughtless, delighted, accepting with laughter the good gifts of fortune, and blind to the disappointment and vexed ambitions that surrounded her. This is the family portrait that we find in the letters of Henry the Second. He wrote to Montmorency, I never saw so joyous a bride. She never does anything but laugh. I have heard that the King of Navarre intends to go to Nevers, taking his daughter. I have not determined to refuse them the permission for it seems to me that having married their daughter, I have the best hostage they can give. He pretends to be the best contented father in the world. You know the man. But from all I can learn from him and from many others, now that his daughter is really married, he thinks of nothing but amassing a large fortune and making good cheer. The Queen of Navarre is at daggers drawn with her husband. Through her love for her daughter, who for her part makes no account of her mother. You never saw any one cry so much as my aunt when she went away, and if it had not been for me, she would never have gone back with her husband. End of section 24